Hi, my name is Thomas Veal. This is part two of the ADL workbench, workbench Getting Started tutorial. Now, let's have a look around the tool in a bit more detail and see what we can see. First of all, uh, let's start in the repository. So we're looking at the CKM repository. Uh, since the beginning I've added in a few more uh, profile so now I've got also repositories for SIMI, AD 1.5 test, open air EHR extract area. We'll stick with the open air uh, archetypes for the moment. Now one use of option that we can do which makes life much more beautiful is that we use reference model icons which are supplied for uh, some of the reference models. If we do this the icons that some people will recognize from the open air CKM are now used for the classes or at least most of them and then we have uh, archetypes underneath. So let's just have a look at an archetype and see what we can see. Here's a nice simple one, the Apgar archetype and you can see here the structure of the archetype. It's opened out into a at a rather convenient sort of level so that we can see uh, the main data points and you can read down through the structure here. Now this is a rather technical tool, there's different ways to view what you're seeing on the screen. The view we've got at the moment is uh, relatively friendly for clinical people to read so they can just see the main data points, they can see that it's inside a certain data structure which is a history of events structure uh, inside the root class. You can see paths appearing on the way down uh, on these various nodes. Now we can start looking at how we can change the view. If you're interested in what the reference model classes are, choose the technical uh, option over here and you'll see that the class names appear such that we have class name, attribute name, class name, attribute name exactly as taken from the reference model. If you weren't sure that that's what you're really seeing you might want to right click there and display that class and you'll see that class in uh, the class tool and you'll see observation data state and these are the various properties of the class down here now uh, if we go back here you'll see observation data, history, off type history and then events. We can go back here and just uh, verify to ourselves that that's really what it is. Let's have a look at history and you'll see things like these um, attributes here, pro properties and you'll see the same things here, history events and history events here and we could keep going in the same fashion and you'll see the structure. So that underlying structure is uh, what's in, built into the archetype. Usually it's quite easy to understand what you're looking at even without those class names because the icons they're, they're relatively easy to understand and very quickly you learn which class corresponds to which icon. So we have rather a nice view there. Now we could, you can see a lot of words there, respiratory effort, if we open out one of those you can see some more words there but of course these aren't really words, they're codes and we might want to look at the codes and you can see some actual codes there, these are archetype local codes. It may be the case that such codes have been bound to SNOMED, LOINC or other external codes and we'll look at that in a moment. Normally you don't need to see these codes, they're a slight visual pollution but just to be reassured that they're always available. An archetype, if it's been translated, will be available in multiple languages and if you're a native German speaker you might like to look at it like that. If you're a Farsi speaker you'll look at it like that. Uh, a uh, Russian speaker and so on. Now let's have a little bit more of a look around in the archetype catalogue. We'll see that there are other archetypes, of course the famous blood pressure and many more. We also see that some archetypes are ch 
children of uh, archetypes. So for example this adjusted weight archetype here is a child of the body weight archetype. There's the body weight archetype structure and we can explore that as we've just been doing. This child archetype only contains the changes with respect to the parent in a very similar way that an object oriented class say in the Java programming language or similar would only contain things that have been either redefined or added new compared to its parent class. So one of the important things that you need to understand about archetypes and about using this tool is how to view that kind of thing uh, which you can think of essentially as inheritance. So we'll just get our viewing area set up a little bit better here. At the moment we're viewing the what's called the differential uh, specification of this archetype. So there's a path, it's a long path, and at that path it's saying that a quantity uh, constraint has been defined as follows. If we want to see what that really looks like in terms of how it modifies the body weight archetype, its parent, we choose this button here. This shows us the full what's called flattened view. That means applying the differential specification of this uh, source archetype in its source form over the top of the parent archetype. Now you might be wondering, well, okay, but how do I see which parts are which? If we use this button down here, inheritance, we can see what's been changed and you can see that adjusted weight uh, has been overridden and contains this changed part here. If we were to go back to the parent we would see just weight and uh, an original definition there. Now this difference between the differential and flattened view is quite important not only for the archetype itself. Now have a look here we have a number of switches for uh, RM visibility. As most of you will probably understand archetypes are based on reference model classes and properties or attributes which you can see here. When an archetype is built only certain parts of the reference model are archetyped as is needed. If you wanted to see what parts of the reference model hadn't been archetyped, in other words uh, attributes that were defined in the reference model but for which no constraint had been stated, you can press choose uh, uh, the data properties reference model visibility option here. This will show you uh, the kind of uh, attributes, i.e. properties from the reference model. And of course we're in the flat view, you'll see them flattened all the way through the reference model inheritance hierarchy as well. If I went to the differential view you would see far fewer because you would see only for example these attributes here defined by let's say the history class period duration and summary. Now we'll go back to the flat view and you're really seeing essentially what the the data implication of uh, an archetype is with this flattening. We can add uh, further properties they're actually all the same properties it's just attributes from classes or properties from classes within the reference model. However the reference models that we use in this tool are quite smart and they have uh, properties classified in different ways. So these ones that you're now seeing are indeed just normal reference model properties but classified as runtime meaning that they're very unlikely to be uh, constrained in archetypes and would normally only be set in the runtime. Now you can explore down into this class structure as well and you can see here for example this feeder audit class has its own properties and you can continue on in that fashion. The last category of properties is infrastructure properties. Properties in other words that don't have uh, any data, uh, let's say clinical meaning as uh, data and are used to actually manage uh, the data instances. So for example things like UIDs and node IDs and generally mechanical stuff which most people don't want to see. However, like anything, it's always useful 
to enable the inquisitive mind to see what's really available behind the scenes before getting rid of it. Now, leaving data properties on can be quite a useful thing to do. A clinical uh, modeling specialist might be thinking about, for example, what data attributes do I need to put into uh, an event if we just choose this example here. Now this is any event, just means a, a measurement event or a sampling event in the body weight observation. There's some data in there that's obviously to do with weight, not very controversial. State is to do with the state of the, uh, the patient in terms of uh, what's relevant to the particular measurement. Now you can see some other bits and pieces here that have appeared because of turning on this data properties. The first thing you can do is you can just verify for yourself like you did before that in fact those things do actually come from the reference model and you can explore uh, in various ways the details there. The second reason why these attributes are useful is it tells that the, the clinical modeling person, the authors and reviewers, that certain things are built in essentially automatically by the reference model and there's no need to create new attributes to represent them. For example, in this case, period, duration, uh, offset of an event from the beginning of the history. Uh, if we add in runtime properties, we will see the history origin, uh, the time of the event, of course that's a runtime set thing, and so on. So this just gives you a, a proper feeling for what the data really look like in uh, a system. So we'll go back to the simple view of this model. There's the domain view and it's worth just having a look at this tree zoom uh, control here. This enables you to navigate pretty conveniently down through the hierarchy. You can go back to nothing. You can go all the way out to the maximal possible extent and collapse back uh, as suits you. If you click on one of these uh, element nodes, you can see that's an element node. That's the element class from the open air, also the SEN uh, models. If you click on one of those nodes, you'll see that it conveniently opens out all the way down. So let's have a, a little look around a few other things. Just off the screen there I'm choosing the heart rate and so we can see the kinds of things that clinical people will expect in terms of measuring heart rate and rhythm. Again it's an observation class, uh, contains the typical history of events and ultimately elements and clusters structure. So let's consider now what we're seeing in red. Anything in red is a constraint. Uh, in the archetype formalism. If we expand out any of these nodes we'll see that there are constraints. For example, heart rate present is a constraint on a Boolean data type and there's the actual constraint. Uh, well, that's just saying it can be either value, so it's not much of a constraint. We can have a quantity constraint which is constraining the property frequency and there's a certain range. It's giving the units, so per minute, beats per minute, and precision. This is a typical constraint on a coded text. Uh, so the code phrase is consists of a terminology ID that just indicates the local archetype terminology and the code string. So there we have these three terms. As we showed before, these are local codes. Now, there are many other uh, possible types of constraint. I'll just have a look at a couple. This node here is what's known as a slot. I won't explain in great detail, but for those who know, they'll probably recognize this expression on the right-hand side. Now, that's a very technical view, so a nice uh, thing that the tool does for you is determines what the possible slot fillers are. If I choose that archetype there, it will give me that archetype in the tool and I can explore that separately uh, from the archetype that referred to it. And the same thing here to do with devices. I can go and look at the device archetype. 